I feel sure that all present here are familiar with the idea that the kingdom of heaven is not a located place. It is not somewhere that you can travel even by jet. At least not physical jet. As we well know the ancient utterance concerning the kingdom of heaven is that it is with of consciousness leading to a certain attitude of mind towards living and all other living beings and things in the main characterized by an abiding sense of all that exists. Thus the kingdom of heaven is indeed within us and this afternoon we are going to consider together some of the basic ideas of the oldest and the very best of all sciences, the science of the soul of man, or if you like, consonant with our subject and my title, the science of the attaining, yes, and I'll add, the science of the attaining and the man of the kingdom of heaven. I believe that this subject is of the utmost importance to humanity as a whole at this time. The problem concerning human behavior can ultimately be brought down to the consideration of the ethical and the spiritual values involved. And so, we time this afternoon seeking that state of awareness where the spiritual part of us will influence everything we think and say and do. Is there a way of bringing us for ourselves by some particular method? Yes, indeed there is. And the name for the science is called in Sanskrit yoga. The name of the science of waking oneself. Yogi, one who practices yoga, is wide awake to reality. And so if we study yoga, it is because we, we are seeking ultimate reality. When we turn our attention on this subject, we find that yoga is twofold. It consists of certain elements of knowledge, which might be called yoga philosophy and yoga practice, putting the knowledge to work upon ourselves. Let me then briefly, and without too much discourse upon them, state the essential knowledge upon which the practice of yoga may be founded I think I must alter that upon which the practice must be founded if we are going to succeed the knowledge consists of six postulates which I put for your consideration and the first of them is that a sharp distinction exists between man's personality and the deeper aspects of his nature. The reality in him, if you like. The divine spirit essence which is the core of man's existence. The spiritual soul, inner self of man. The true individuality behind the bodily veil. It is important from the very beginning of one's study and practice of yoga always to remember that. This is not 
It's a temporary, evanescent, ever-changing, flowing vesture, which the real thinker and spirit within is using during waking hours. Thus, man in yoga, a second existence, untouched by time and unsullied by worldly concerns and activities. The true self, the one unitary center of consciousness and selfhood of each and every one of us. This that we have to seek. It is this that we have to find. And finding, enter the kingdom of heaven. About this spiritual self of man, there is an important statement. Universe, or universal spirit. These two being completely identical. Man's spirit and God's spirit are one spirit. That's the heart of yoga philosophy. The sovereign secret. The spiritual self in each one of us is identical with the total spiritual self of the universe as a whole. Correct of the unity of the spirit of man with the spirit of the universe, this waking realization is the objective, the supreme objective of yoga. Hence its name, yoga, which means union. So I repeat, yoga philosophy is that royal secret that man's spirit and God's spirit are one spirit. Or, <coughs> to put it in the, in the words of our Lord, I and my Father, that, says the yogi, that am I. And he allows his contemplative thought to soar beyond the limitations of bodily being into absorption in the one Lord of life and the ocean of the universe. That probably sounds to be a very difficult assignment. Not so, really, because as soon as anyone desires self-realization, you, for example, and I would not be here if we hadn't begun, hadn't we hadn't passed through the essential test, which is wanting to know. And as soon as anyone wants to know, the inward for the self is moved, inspired by the self. And when we turn our thoughts eagerly, seekingly to this great subject, we are really inwardly moved by our own awakened divine self. Is focused into an individuality in man. And this is called his spiritual soul. As I've said, the true self in each one of us. The Christ indwelling. The Logos of the soul. God for which St. Paul said our bodies were temples. This is the dweller in the innermost. Now this true self of man perpetually unfolds its inherent. It perpetually unfolds or evolves towards the stature of perfected manhood. And according to yoga philosophy and theosophy also, this is achieved by means of successive lives. And here we are said to be born over and over again, unfolding more and more faculties, life after life, until at last, as St. Paul, whom I quote again, great 
Christian yogi as he was and is, he said, describing our destiny until we all come in the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto our destiny. The goal to which everything is bringing you. All the experiences of life, none being wasted. Everything that happens to us, playing its actually after a sufficient number of lives. The full lesson is learnt, the full powers unfolded. And all weaknesses overcome. Then the man is an occult say, in yoga philosophy, the operation of the law of cause and effect assures absolute justice to each and every human being always. His own actions decide the conditions of each life towards the condition of perfected manhood. And now last, of this series of teachings in yoga philosophy, the crowning idea, it is this. The normal condition of consciousness can be changed so that self-realization can be entered at any time and ultimately adeptship can become established in an individual far in advance of age. This can be done. The interior state of consciousness called the kingdom of heaven can, as we say, be taken by storm. And that's what yoga, as a, an active science is. The citadel of the soul of man of taking the kingdom of heaven by storm. For as I mentioned on opening, the kingdom of heaven is not an ideal to be made possible of realization in some re The kingdom of heaven is an ever-existing, self-luminous state of being to be re realized here, to be realized now. Or you might change it and say the kingdom of heaven is a truth operative in all the processes of living. And it is this state that we seek and this truth which the yogi ultimately found, finds. The method of finding is called yoga in practice. <coughs> and what I have outlined briefly now let us turn to the practice and see what the ancient seers of old taught to man thousands upon thousands of years ago in sharing that which they had found attainment. Illumination is attained by yoga in its total meaning and its application to life. It's something you have to live here, day by day. Yoga isn't something you can turn on and off like a faucet. Nor seek, or at first you gain gleams thereof. And eventually it is something which illumines your whole life. Motives, thoughts, feelings, yes. Words, deeds, your very pies in the clasp of your hand. All of these ideally and ultimately reflect the illumined state of the successful yogi. But you don't have to go away into the jungle or the cell. Yoga is not otherworldliness, inwardness. Yoga is not shirking one's duty. It is proper and ceaseless performance of one's duty. Yoga is not running away from home and human habita habitations. 
into forests and caves. It's viewing the home in a new light. Yoga is not an avoidance of society. It is cultivation of an all-embracing love for all that live. Such in part is yoga. Practice steadily in you all wisdom and joy, the true kingdom of heaven. How well worth practicing. How well worth even studying academically. That's the start. Less for oneself than for humanity as a whole. In order to be an, an ideal citizen to study and to practice in the perfect performance of worldly duties, this ancient science of the capture of the kingdom of heaven. Yoga is valuable, even in our daily lives. It ensures efficiency. It makes available to the person extraordinary physical, mental, intellectual, psychic, wonderful science, a wonderful procedure. The true religion of man. The way of light and life. And I believe the only way of peace within and so peace on earth. Now, when we examine it, success depends upon two procedures. One, and this is going to be a hurdle, two procedures. One, the control and the right use of thought, of some form of meditation and yoga as a part of life. Two necessities, bringing the thought forces, the mind and the thinking process under control, and engaging every day in of the divine. At the end, I will refer to that. Now, more closely examining the teaching, it is found that there are actually seven branches of yoga. Seven methods, really. Branch of the main yoga philosophy. Each of the seven with its own special methods or accentuations of methods. And its own practice. And its own immediate objectives. But all kinds of true yoga have only one objective. Self-discovery. Which implies Realization of union with God. Hence the name yoga, which means to unite or union. Well, kinds of yoga. They are evidently designed by the great seers of old to suit the people uh, belonging to the seven human temperaments. The power people the wisdom, the devotees, and the magician. We all belong to one of those, and there's a yoga for each of us. We may, if we like, and it's advisable, I think, to combine more than one, as we'll see as we go on. I've taken first ta yoga. The very word and the sound of it tells its central idea. Ha, ta yoga. Ha, science of breathing. Ha, ta yoga aims at bodily mastery. In breathing as a science and mental control of body as a means of attaining true harmony of body and mind. Too long a sentence? I'll say it again. In hatha, in hatha yoga, you must learn to relax. Breathing, and I'll talk about it in a minute, breathing as a science, mental control of body, 
all three as means of attaining true harmony of body and bring them into harmonious unity and integration throughout the whole personality. About breathing, here is what is taught. It is the practice of the neutralization of the process of breathing. Alternately, these are called sun and moon breathing, or as we would say, positive and negative breaths. <coughs> and the object of this peculiar kind of breathing is <coughs> to completely positive and the negative breaths and the electromagnetic forces in the body so that equipoise between them is established and the body is in still peace. Then they are ready for full realization, which we'll consider later on. I would like to warn, if I may, against any very peculiar and eccentric systems of breath control unless you are under the direction of a qualified ex. The next is called karma yoga. Karma means action. And the karma yogi aims at perfect skill in action. But he recognizes that there is only one actor who is the supreme lord of the universe. And all work is, ren is as service rendered for him, impersonally, and in the name of the lord. That's karma yoga. Or as we say in the West, he who works, pray, gives mastery over the power of dedicated action and is suitable for very busy people and those who don't readily engage in contemplative thought. So the karma yogi works, but he's not bad, but he doesn't expect a reward. He is efficient but he doesn't expect admiration or even appreciation. He's dynamic, but he's not worried whether he succeeds or fails to achieve any tangible result. Whether he, these are matters of indifference to the true karma yogi. For him, work in the name of the Lord is its own fulfillment. Whether pleasure or pain accrues for his effort. Furthermore, he works for the welfare of all, and yet all affected by success or failure, pain or pleasure. And this is a very important branch of yoga. It's being called the yoga for the modern man, for the man of the 20th century, though it is for all. Karma yoga. Work dedicated to the welfare of all and to the Lord of life, working in all. Morris and Paul put it, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it in you. And so everything the karma yogi does is unto the Lord, in the Lord's name, and without a sense of being divided from him, and caring not for his own. A very lofty ideal. Rather strange sounding name. L-A-Y-A, Laya Yoga. Or Laya Yoga. Laya Yoga gives mastery over the powers of will and mind. And ultimately awakens the hidden in man. For this reason, it's rather a dangerous form of yoga unless you are under the direction of a guru well versed in the science who can direct your attempts to awaken and arouse your own spiritual awareness certain secret forces, creative energies resident in the bodies of all men. When these are awakened, they electrify the brain. 
It's the creative force from which the sex impulse comes, but transmuted into spirit, called up into the brain, mind and spirit, instead of expressed physically. And this bestows genius, the fire of genius in man and enables him to realize unity with God in his body, wide awake, so that he can know that which laia really means, to be dissolved, to be absorbed in God, like water in water, light in light, space in, in space. That's the great goal and adventure and quest of every yogi. But in Laya Yoga, occult forces are aroused and we are warned of the dangers until the master appears. It has occurred to me that the Laya Yogi would be able to help us we Western people in modern days, in the extraordinary accentuation of the sex force and interest in sex and sexuality by which humanity seems to be beset today, almost to its degradation. What would a, an illumined yogi say to us about that? Supposing we could find one. We are wrong in thinking that sex expression is essential to a full human life. He would deny that as a profound error. He would warn us, I think, saying that excess, the natural function, but excess, he would say, dulls the brain, exhausts the vitality, takes the fine, keen edge of the mind, whilst undue indulgence, formality. And that is, I suppose, why in yoga and in occult communities that chastity is one of the great ideals. He probably, if we could get him to talk, he would tell us that uh, the sex impulse itself in man and being a force in his body, it's subject to the control of his thought and his will. And if we said to him, well, how, how are we going to do that? He would say, purify your thoughts, and then direct in and out at the top of the head. Draw it away from body to mind and spirit. Yes, he might go just a step further there and say, if you like, when you are performing your to the one creator of all, into the reservoir of solar creative power, and find yourself absorbed therein, then, of course, the desire dies away completely. As the Gratis and say, you with your worship of efficiency may know that all round efficiency would result from success. Rather important message from the East to the West in these days. From the East to the West, my notes concerns what is called jnana yoga. J or G N A N A. Jnana means knowledge. These are the intellectualists who think their way out of separateness into union, founded upon and distilled from knowledge and the experiences of life. Jnana Yoga develops the mind and gives mastery over all the powers of the intellect. Jnana Yoga thus leads to the attack. The ideal is that you come to a condition where you could never be deceived about anything. Truth is known 
and is the unfailing touchstone in all circumstances. And the Yani can never more. Which includes the realization of that single absolute truth, which is regarded as the source of all phenomena and all our perceptions are in the universe. For example, despite the richness of individuality everywhere apparent, despite the exuberant variety of nature's forms, there is within all of them. Despite the appearance of difference, difference, one life, one reality, one being. All notions of multiplicity are known as unreal, illusory. Such is the special goal of jnana yoga, to know absolutely, completely to comprehend, to be beyond the possibility. I believe certain legal and police officers and others arrive at this kind of intuitive sense in which they can tell whether a person is telling a lie or not. Well, that exalted to a far higher level to own it despite the variety of appearances. That is the goal. To know absolutely completely to comprehend, to be beyond the possibility of being deceived. This is exalted into a supreme virtue. There's a Japanese proverb about it which says, it's a little bit uh, mysterious, but it is this, the power of man is non-deception. Think it over study and lecturing but we must move on now to the sixth yoga called bhakti yoga b-h-a-k-t-i sanskrit word meaning devotion these are the devotees who care for philosophy for knowledge for intellect for understanding all they want is to be one with the beloved, caring for naught else. I noticed in reading one of the letters of Dostoevsky, these words, with attitude of the Bhakta. He, he wrote strangely, if anyone could prove to me that Christ is outside the truth, and if the truth really did exclude Christ, I should prefer to stay with Christ and not with truth. Pure devotee. And these people believe that devotion verily is the nature of the supreme love of God. And on attaining this supreme love and its fulfillment in realized union with him, man mortal, fully satisfied. And the Bhakta on attaining thus does not desire anything else. He neither grieves over any loss, nor hates anything, nor indulges in sensual pleasures, nor feels an urge for the acquisition of... He, he, he's outgrown them and they've fallen away from him apparently. And this divine love is not of the nature of desire because it is of the form of renunciation. It means a single-minded one and an indifference to all that is antagonistic. And the essential characteristics of, de of devotion are the deep consecration of all observances and activities through common... Yes. Life is fulfilled by renunciation, the Bhakta Yogi would say. The practice of devotion, then, and this kind of yoga, for some temperaments, is because divine love doesn't depend upon any other proof. It is its own proof of itself and is felt in one's heart. And that's enough for the devotee.
It's a wonderful path. It's the Christian path. You recognize that as I go along. It's of the nature of peace and supreme bliss. The devotee feels no anxiety about his worldly concerns since he has wholly consecrated himself to his Lord. Thus, flowed up, dissolved in him, the goal of the devotee. And finally, Raja Yoga. That title will be a or a king, and this is generally called the kingly yoga. It accentuates consciousness, dissociates the self, that's the inward, true, unit of awareness and existence. It dissociates that deliberately from moments of expression, the body, the emotions, and the mind. And these, as one book on yoga says, are peeled away, one by one. And only the one interior and as they call it. Raja Yoga gives mastery over all other methods of yoga and develops special powers of discrimination and dissociation and it leads as do all to direct drill of man and then of its unity with the one self in all having discovered the divine in himself, the Raja Yogi, looking at all of us, would see that same self in each one of us. Shine the same as in himself. All identical rays of the one supreme spirit. The Lord of all. That is his way. If you study the methods, you find that they affirmation. They affirm what they seek as if it were a truth. And by continually affirming it and dwelling on the affirmation, it, it, it dawns on them that it is true. Something like this. Let, let, let me discover that anyone of us could, as many do, practice day by day. Supposing you and I, if we haven't already done so, wanted to begin, look into this matter, not only academically, but that as I went along, it, it's the way out of confusion and sorrow and doubt and fear and loneliness. And it is one of the greatest systems of interior therapy there is. touched even the hem of his garment, the fringe of the inner consciousness. Straightway, the outer man is whole. How's it done? Well, there are some simple things. You, you, you need to be regular. You must keep at it every day. Nietzsche said, in the mountains of truth, you never climb in vain. Either you climb higher today or, develop, or you develop the power to climb higher tomorrow. So you must keep on. Not notice it, but there comes very soon a deepening perception, solutions to problems hitherto insoluble. Dreaming true, flashes of intuition, discriminative wisdom grows as day by day, for the kingdom of heaven in which it abides. So, first rule then, keep on. Next, privacy. It is one of the things we have to do for ourselves and by ourselves. No one can do it for us. And then, correct posture of the body, None of the so-called asanas or postures of Hatha Yoga are at all necessary. 
Some of them may be helpful, particularly the lotus posture, posture but as a great yogi, modern yogi said not long ago, any comfortable position of the body is a posture. But there are a few simple rules. For example, the body must be quite relaxed, utterly and completely. The, an ordinary chair, both feet on the ground, spine and head erect, breathing perhaps slowed down a little so that the whole body becomes poised and quiet and peaceful. Then you begin the affirmation. First, interior integral unit of selfhood from the body. I am not the physical body. I am not the emotions. I am not the mind. I am the divine self, you may affirm. You dwell on the thought. Immortal, dwell on that. Radiant with spiritual light. I am that self of light, you say to yourself. Mentally. That self am I. And knowledge and awareness to become centered in and full of the eternal self of light. And then affirm, I am that, that am I. Darken formal mind and brain. Or if you like, you can say, I am self-shining, pure being, rooted in the eternal. And give consciousness time to acquire my father, our one. That's all. Except that we must live it out as a part of our lives. But there is a strange thing that can happen. Sooner or later, after regular practice, Along the lines I've described, sooner or later, after regular practice, affirmation and contemplation, equipoise is attained. Effortless, it comes to you. Silence enfolds one. As if the mind had become dissolved in its source. One forgets all words. All efforts cease. Even contemplative thought ceases to be replaced by a mirror-like awareness. And if this comes to you, don't disturb it. Stay in it. Awareness of mind. It descends upon one as if the mind were at rest in the ocean of reality. And then, in this silence, what is called the voice of the silence is heard. As itself, as a self-declaration of spirit, is made to the outer man. Then you begin to know, indeed I am not this, I am that eternal one. So, entering this regularly, day by day, one taps the infinite source of power within one and gradually learns to express it with increasing efficiency and fullness in all the affairs of daily life and in all the contacts with men. to live in increasing spirituality and beauty. There I must stop, friend. Such in outline only, thus we may find peace and serenity of heart and unshakable happiness. Such is the